Well, hello. It's time for another exciting episode of Pens in Use. This is the show where I talk about the fountain pens and inks I've been using throughout the week. And this week, I'm in historic Marmoth, North Dakota. So it's also a little bit of a pens on the road. So let's dive into it. So if videos like this interest you where I talk about fountain pens both new and old and at all price points, I would invite you to subscribe. And hey, do you have any cool little towns like this around where you live? Let us know down in the comments. All right, so these are the fountain pens that I've been using this week. Uh, of course, they have the Waterman Exception, which performs so exceptionally well that it has new ink in it. I have... <laughs> I can't resist it, I'm sorry. Uh, Par Parker Tool Fold, which has been my daily writer. Uh, since I've been out and about, as you'll see later in the video, I have my Parker, sorry, Moon Man Mini One Kai, uh, Romus Majestic, Parker Dual Fold, um, Pilot Custom 823, and the, apparently this uh, Aurora 88 stole their clip from that. Ooh. Uh, Twisby Draco, Vintage Aurora 88, Modern Aurora 88, Parker 61, and a uh, Swan Maybe Todd with some number that I wrote in the description I don't remember. As always, <clears throat> although soon to end because I'm getting to the end of the notebook, I will be using the seafood, seafood themed Cognitive Surplus Journal. Alright, so my first pen is the Waterman Exception, which is a square pen. I wish the camera caught better the color of this pen because it, it's kind of iridescent. It goes from almost a purple to a blue, depending on the light. But anyway, it has a, a square section, which took me a little while to get used to. But, you know, when I start writing with it, I'm just like, ew, no. Oops, that was a really bad... Uh, parenthesis and then I forget that it's square and I go on writing and don't even think about it it has a nice nib writes well ran out of Parker Quink washable Garosha Zook <laughs> ah, I spent my whole day in Marmoth I'm, I'm all messed up then I made the mistake of going over to Baker Montana afterward didn't film anything in Baker, but I might have to do a video there. Uh, the town in Montana I really want to do is Ekalaka. That's a cool little town. Baker's kind of nice, though, because it has a lake right in the middle of town. I mean, it's like seriously right on Main Street. So, but I went to uh, Marmoth. I, I'd been planning to go there on the 4th of July, but I got a better offer for uh, 4th of July, so I thought... Eh, I'll just drive to... Holy buckets, is that overexposed. We'll go back to this. Yipe! <laughs> Should have said something to me. Okay, my next pen is a Parker Dual Fold. I don't remember what I was talking about. I, I kind of got distracted there when I looked up on my preview screen and said... Holy buckets, that's really bad. So this has been kind of my daily writer. I might refill it one more time. And then I'll move on to another one. You know, I give that Lamy 2000 a break all summer. And uh, I've been trying to use up my bottle of Parker Quink Black. You know, I realized that black is the ink that I go through the fastest. And I've got several different bottles of different kinds of black ink, so I just thought to myself, self, why not use them up? Because that'll make a major dent in my uh, ink collection in, as part of my ongoing battle to rid myself of bottles of ink. So, uh, anyway, I'm very close to having this one used up. Probably uh, when I fill up my uh, Pilot Custom 823, which I think I'll do next, I will use up what's left of the bottle. This is my uh, Moonman Mini One Kai. 
uh, walking around Marmoth today and Baker. I dress like a pig. You know, I if you ever meet me out in public, I, I'm i not the neatly dressed, really hot guy. I'm the, the ugly old slob wearing the teenager shorts and a t-shirt. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, I need a pen. And this pen is cheap. So, hey. Uh, it used to be I, I would take, like, the uh, Caveco Sport out with me, but uh, this is a lot cheaper than a Caveco Sport. So, I totally forgot what I was writing here. Parker Quink Black. Plus, uh, I, I'll just admit it. Part of the reason I picked this pen is the uh, eyedropper fill. I thought, hey, maybe I can get through it pretty quickly. So, I haven't had this pen out in quite a while. I don't mind how it feels in my hand. It feels a little nicer than the Caveco Sport. I will say, uh, you know, it's not the best writer. It's okay. But then again, the Caveco Sport isn't really that great of a writer either. So, what you gonna do? Finish is cool though. It's, you know, it's kind of three-dimensional. I've seen that effect on some of the uh, Visconti pens that I don't own and can't afford. My next pen is a Romus Majestic, and honestly, it's been sitting in my pen case, but I don't know that I've written with it at all this week. Hmm, definitely haven't written with it this week. That's disappointing. Some pens you can let them sit for a while and they write. Which you can't see me doing is off screen trying to get this thing writing. Okay. Apparently this isn't one of them. Romus. Majestic. Let me uh, look up what ink is in it because I don't remember. Roshizuku Yamaguri. Uh, <clears throat> I just used up my bottle of uh, Tsukushi from the same manu manufacturer, uh, which is a discontinued ink. I've actually been very successful with the Hiroshizuku inks using up bottles. A little bit the color verse, but I only have four bottles of that. But definitely with the Hiroshizuku. I think that Ama Iro, which I used with the Waterman Exception. I wrote Water Exception. Holy cow. Here, I'll show you here in just a second. got to finish up my swatch. Maybe I should make my swatch smaller. Yeah, water exception. And none of you told me I was screwing up. My next pen is a Parker Dual Fold. This is one way I want the exposure to be better. But, you know, the white paper I think confuses it. Uh, this is going to go downhill because I'm too high up. Parker Dual Fold. Streamline Junior. This, I feel like, has an oblique nib. I don't know that. It just sure looks like it. Platinum Classic. Lavender black. I actually have two lavender whoops black. Have two lavender plants growing in my uh, front bed. I gotta hurry up and do a gardening video. I was kinda hoping I'd get all the cleanup and everything done before I filmed that video, but you know, I now miss doing my June video of gardening, so Maybe we'll do an early July and a late July to make up with it, and then I can do an August. I'll be gone <clears throat> the first part of August, so, uh, yeah, I'll probably just do one video in August, but whatever. 
Uh, then I have my Twisby Draco, which is a really pretty pen. Just apparently not when it's laid against white paper. And this is a fun ink. Very dark. It's one that you can use for business-like purposes. Because um, it's very dark. But it's got a little bit of fun to it. So this is De Atramentis. Aubergine. We won't talk <laughs> until I do my gardening video uh, about how many aubergine plants I put in my garden this year. More than I need for sure. So I'm going to have to find a way to use them. One year I tried pickling eggplant but I wasn't super thrilled with how it turned out. But There might be some other recipes I can try got to be a way to preserve it. But anyway, very pretty purple. Very dark, very subtle, but I like it. And I like this pen a lot. This pen is old. It's from the 40s. Oh, my battery's almost dead. I had it on the charger since I filmed my last writing sample, so I don't know what I did. I Oh. <laughs> the <laughs> other end of the charger is not plugged in. That would do it. So this is the Aurora 88 vintage version. So I should put vintage in parentheses. Last week I was getting a little leaking around this trim ring onto my finger, but it's not happening this week. I don't know what that means. Uh, the ink in it is Diamine Damson. You know, diamine inks are supposed to be all safe and such, but I've got a couple that are very crusty. You know, they, they just have different properties. When you have a wide range of inks, you're going to have a wide range of properties. Uh, Noodlers gets in trouble for it. Um, honestly, Nathan Tardiff kind of brings it on himself sometimes. Um, because sometimes just a little bit of politeness goes a long way. Or not speaking your mind every time you've got an opinion. Aurora 88 with the Giove finish. I gotta figure out what the heck I did with my lighting. I used to be able to balance the pens and the writing. I've done something stupid and I don't know what. So this is a broad nib and the ink in it is Stipula Palamo Saffron Yellow. Interesting way of spelling saffron. I don't know if that's Italian or what's going on. Um, got kind of behind on cleaning out my pens, so I did a bunch of them today. And uh, One of them has that stipula T flex nib. So you might be seeing the T flex back next week. But not in a stipula pen because I hate that stipula pen. It feels good, it looks good, but I can't get it to write <laughs> with whatever nib I put in it. I take that stipula nib out of it, put it in a different pen, boom, perfect pen. I don't get it. All right, Parker 61, which is filled by capillary action and has a little handy thingy so you know which way to point it. I don't know what kind of nib it is, but I do know what kind of ink it is. It's Pelican 4001 Royal Blue. Basically the Parker Quink washable blue of the Pelican world. Uh, 
I have got a gob of this stuff too, so it's possible when I run out of Parker Quink washable blue I'll switch to this, but I don't know, I'm so closely associated with that Parker Quink washable blue that I kind of hate to give that trademark up. And finally, my swan may be Todd, and I've got the number open, 3240, whoops, off screen, which is green, I promise. I don't know what I did wrong with the exposure these last couple of weeks. I seem to have lost the talent for filming pens in use since my little absence there. Swan, maybe Todd. Thirty-two forty, and the ink in it is Roar and Klingner. I'll just write that. Alt Goldgrun. Which is a really fun green. I'm going to be... Ooh, now I'm down to five minutes. So, I will not talk long. Uh, I'm going to be very sad when this bottle runs out. But again, I want to get my ink collection down. But I think if I had a list... Oh, definitely a... Not an oblique. A Curse of Italic, maybe. Uh, but definitely if I had a list of favorite inks... You know, the survivors that I would want in my collection, this would be one of them. So anyway, I've got now three minutes of battery left. Wow, that died quickly. So I'm going to leave you now, and we're going to look at Marmoth. So those are the pens and inks I've been using this week. Now we're going to visit historic Marmoth, North Dakota. And yes, I'm in Marmoth right now. Marmoth is in a valley. In fact, uh, we're starting here at near Rain, North Dakota, which is at an elevation of 3,192 feet, or 973 meters. And we descend down this valley into the Badlands around the Little Missouri River, where Marmoth is located, at 2,710 feet, or 826 meters. So that's a drop of either 482 feet or 147 meters, depending on what you're into. And uh, it makes a world of difference, because Marmoth is forested it, it was known for its trees it's even been called the city of trees uh, and that's because of its proximity to the little missouri river teddy roosevelt visited there sitting bull visited there and as you can see in this little bit of footage here it is located in the badlands marmoth is in an absolutely gorgeous location and i kind of wonder if it had managed to be located by the interstate, instead of out in the middle of flipping nowhere, how different the trajectory of Marmoth could have been. Marmoth is estimated to have a current population of about 137 people, which sounds really specific for an about. But at one time, Marmoth had 1,500 people, possibly more if you listen to some accounts. Um... And that is going to play into my story of Marmoth in a huge way, because Marmoth has really been affected by that precipitous drop in population. You know, the heyday was in the 1920s, and it's just been all downhill since then. Um, you know, you think of other cities which have suffered population loss, like Detroit, Michigan, It has a big effect. And uh, in some ways, Marmoth is illustrative of uh, rural decay. You know, my town is undergoing rural decay too, but not nearly to this level. So I just want to point out at the beginning that I absolutely love Marmoth, but I don't wear rose-colored glasses. I know the problems Marmoth has. I also had a lot of problem with lawnmower noise because Marmoth is getting ready for their big uh, July 4th thing and uh, <laughs> they're trying to spiffy up the town. So, uh, you know, put up with some lawnmower noise as we tour a beautiful, beautiful town in southwestern North Dakota. So this is the original jail in Marmoth, North Dakota, uh, dating, I think, from 1908. 
Uh, you can see they have a lovely cot that's on chains that folds down. And you can see who made it. <laughs> um, I'm imagining it was indoors back then, but I don't know that. But yeah, it's a pretty darn secure jail. And then here next door is uh, just an abandoned, I don't know what, house, store, whatever. What really appealed to me when I saw this building was actually the graffiti on the side because it's not new graffiti. I, I, you know, I'm not a fan of graffiti ever, but come on, it's from 1952 carved into the stucco. Let's enjoy it. Uh, next, I want to look at this building. I don't know the name of the building, but it is a very, very attractive building. Now, I first came through Marmoth, North Dakota about 20 years ago uh, for a family event, and I wanted to see southwest, southwestern North Dakota. And uh, I remember seeing a tiki bar that was closed up. Now, I, maybe I made that up, but when I see Cactus Club, I'm thinking, tiki bar! So I'm wondering if that's what I saw. You know, memory plays games after that amount of time, but... Anyway, this was a cool building, but now they want you to stay out. And good thing, too, because it, it's full of pigeons and pigeon poop and pigeon pee, and it smells horrible. In fact, when I got back in the car, this was the last building I walked by. I, I could swear I could still smell it on me. So, yeah, I know the signs say stay out. You don't have to tell me. I will stay out. This building is gross. But... If somebody had the money, this is such a cool building that I would love to see it restored. And here on the south side of the building is a neat little storefront. Which just, again, I'm just thinking, holy cow, if we could just restore this thing, what potential it has. Okay, maybe not a lot of potential. Um, <laughs> it's in Marmoth, after all. But... Uh, it could be something amazing. And here we're looking at it from the back. Uh, again, just kind of showing the condition it's in. And that yard is full of junk. And then just walking by it. And looking toward our next building, which is the Barber Auditorium, which was built in 1918. So let's take a look at it. So the Barber Auditorium was built in 1918. Uh, it had a bank on the main floor. Second floor had a huge auditorium, and the seats are still there, but very trashed. And one of the links I have provides interior photographs, but I'm not brave enough to go in there or stupid enough. And uh, there were even ghost hunters visited this building. And I don't believe in ghosts, but you can see why they would think this would be a ghost place. And just a quick shot of the building we were just visiting which I don't know what its name is but it looks cool and here's the back of the Barber Auditorium you know a, a basement thingy which is semi collapsed you know, just kind of sad to see and you know it's just kind of amazing you know here's this huge impressive building and it dominates the city But it's just falling into ruin. But all is not doom and gloom. You know, there is the Mystic Theater, which was built in 1911. is one of the oldest theaters in the United States. And <laughs> uh, very well maintained. It uh, currently hosts different plays. and I don't think it does any movies, but speakers and such. Just uh, very cool. And the people of Marmoth have kept it up, and... I mean, look at that. That's what you would have seen in 1911. And I will just add that there is the Pastime Barn Grill next door, which has a dumb waiter in it. And... I mean the elevator between stairs for food. And a patron who was lubed up on Liquid Courage apparently ensconced himself inside and tried to use it and ended up having to have emergency services rescue him while he was trapped between floors. 
the food there is good, and uh, now stop by if you're in Marmoth. Also at the end of Main Street, we have a community building, which I'm not sure what it's called, but I know I've attended a fundraiser type potluck there before. And it has a fountain, which Main Street Marmoth used to have several fountains. This is the bunkhouse. Used to be for railroad workers, but now it's open to the public. It is uh, basically a dormitory style motel. And the railroad, of course, played a prominent role in Marmoth. At one time, it had a roundhouse, and uh, people used to lead cattle drives down there. In fact, I know an elderly gentleman. And I want to show you some cottonwood seed. I'll, I'll come back to the elderly gentleman later. Uh, that's the white stuff you see in the air in some of the video. So let's just take a minute to talk about what happened to Marmoth. So like I said, it started around 1,500 people, and now it's around 137 people. So what made it 10 times smaller? Well, here's part of the answer. Back when the town started, it was very fortunate. It was on the shores of the Little Missouri River, and later on you're going to see a dike that protects the town from the Little Missouri River. And it was on the railroad. Now, the river's important because ranchers could lead cattle drives to bring their cattle to Marmoth. You bring your cattle to Marmoth, and then you load them on the train. The train can ship them off to the slaughtering plants in Minneapolis or Chicago or wherever they were. And while you're leading the cattle drive, because you're along the Little Missouri River, you've got enough water for the cattle. I know a man who passed away this past winter, who used to lead cattle drives. I did a video about him a number of years ago. And uh, it's not ancient history. It's recent. Uh, Marmoth also had a roundhouse. It had uh, all kinds of train stuff. So in a lot of ways, it was a rail town. It used to have a high school. Uh, some of the links I put on the website, or I'm sorry, on the video description, will show you that old high school. Later on, we're going to see the bell from that high school, but all of that is gone now. This town is one-tenth of the size it once was. And that explains a lot of what you see in this video. And so I just wanted to show this little interjection as I drive from the west toward Marmoth uh, so you could understand what's going on in this town. So let's get back to touring the town. See, so here's kind of a fun building. It's got these stone pillars and I really don't know what they were. Something makes me think gas station, but I don't know what. But nature has taken its toll on the building. And uh, makes me think of that nothing lasts forever. This is rural decay, not urban decay, but it's definitely decay. Uh, here's some more old buildings. Uh, the red one, actually there are people going in and out of it, so I'm wondering if that one's being restored. But this one... There are still shelves of books in there. I can see them through the window. But I've never seen the store open. So I would love a chance to raid this place. <laughs> and uh, here we see some of the reality of Marmoth. That nice sidewalk, but only Main Street and the Highway 12 are paved. Everything else is unpaved. And again, nice sidewalks. Uh, interestingly, that man I told you about met his wife at a street dance on Main Street of Marmoth uh, many years ago. They had just paved Highway 12 all the way to the Montana border and held a street dance to celebrate. And uh, there she met her cowboy. This is sad. 1954. Beautiful church built back when 
the money and the people were still available to do that kind of thing. And now it's no longer there. This, I want to say friar, but I know it's father. But I only have one father, so nobody else gets called father. But this uh, Jared Wolf pastors three different churches, including this one. Declining population does that. You know, this is the heyday. That's gone. And let's just talk for a minute about one of the dark sides of Marmoth. You have all these lots that used to hold homes. You've got this infrastructure built, but no people in it. And it gets filled in. Sometimes by this. Yeah, I want this as my neighbor. Uh, there is a Marmoth ambulance, by the way. Just this is no longer their current vehicle. <laughs> Thank God. But, uh, you know, this is what's filled up some of the vacant lots that are left as houses have decayed and broken down. People fill it in with this. I don't get it. Now, I say that. And I, like I said, I love Marmoth, and right here you see why. It's in the Badlands. It is in an absolutely gorgeous setting. And by the way, we're looking at the dike along the Little Missouri River there. But we're right there in the Badlands. This is a beautiful town. And I say that looking at this. Cool old historical building. I don't know if it was a school or what. You know, they had a big brick building, which you can see on some of the links I provided. But cool building. And then, oh, what's this? Which, by the way is across the street from their current K through 8 school. We got a whole bunch of trashy broken down vehicles just kind of sitting there doing who knows what. Hey kids, this is uh Marmoth, uh this is your world. I don't get that. Yep, there's the school. Oh, and they apparently had a storm because yipe. <laughs> Glad I wasn't standing under that during the storm. But anyway, they did add on to the school a couple of years ago during the oil boom, but there are some financial issues with that. Currently, 25 students, K through 8. Actually, preschool through 8. Uh, after you get through 8th grade, you got to make a choice. So they can either go 46 miles to the east to Bowman, North Dakota, where they can go to high school, or they can go 18 miles to the west to Baker, Montana, where they can also go to high school. So, guess where most of them go? Uh, this bell here is actually from, I think I was trying to get the sign there, is actually from the original school. But, you know, we kind of cracked the Liberty Bell. Yeah, they did a number on this bell in Marmoth. So, there are some rough characters there. Okay, kind of a weird shot, but... I just want to remind you that with all these houses gone, the infrastructure is still there. City of Detroit, Michigan is dealing with this too. You have to supply everything even though it is so flipping spread out. Sewer cover. As a point of comparison, Marmoth has a population density of 53.14 people per square mile or 20.52 per square kilometer. Nearby Rain, which is the same population, has a population density of 110.37 people per square mile or 42.6 people per square kilometer. Which one is more cost effective, do you think? And let's just go there. Housing in Marmoth is quite interesting. You have inhabited houses next to whatever this is. You have houses that are beautiful. You have houses that are... You have houses that are... I don't know if somebody lives there or not. And you have houses that are like, there's no way in hell anybody lives there. And then you discover that, oh yeah, somebody does. So, you know, I'm not trying to cite any of these houses as any examples of anything. But I wanted to show a variety of the different housing that's in Marmoth. Because, holy cow... Do you want to live next to this house? Well, Marmoth has... Like I said, I love Marmoth, but it, it's got some difficulties. It's got to work through. But then we come back to, why did I say I love Marmoth? 
One of the reasons is the history. Here's the old depot that's been preserved and they've actually improved on the preservation since I've moved to the area. It now has, I won't call it a foundation, but a protection-y thing around its base instead of just sitting on pylons. Um, they've protected the windows. They do need to do something to the roof, but you know, I don't know the whole story behind it, but depot, you can see the old ticket booth there. Uh, very cool historical woodwork. And around the back, I don't know what that is, but a sticky outy thing and uh, more railroady things. And I get it, I've lived in small town Pennsylvania and small town North Dakota my whole life. This country doesn't care about its small towns. They're just left to decay. But it's still really sad to see. Especially such a cool town like Marmoth. Uh, here's a business that's closed for, well, there's some various reasons, but a gas station along Highway 12 should not be closed. But it is. It's for sale, too, if you're looking for a business opportunity. Um, I decided to take a quick look at the gas prices that were left on the uh, pumps because I know it's been a few years since this place closed. I uh, didn't get good footage, but you might notice something there that's a little better than what we're dealing with now. Thank you, oil companies and gas companies, for gouging us while you make record profits and blame it on the politicians because holy cow i'd love to pay this right now for gas that this one i couldn't see it so just to reassure you that not all is lost here's a business it's a smoke shop whatever the hell that is in marmoth with espresso cigars humidors wine beer and all that crap and you apparently can get your hair cut there and a tan so new businesses are in marmoth but this is marmoth too what do we do with all this abandoned space where nobody really wants to move i mean there's not a grocery store here no longer a gas station there's nothing what would draw you to move here to make this place better and i don't have a good answer for it and again marmoth specifically is this what the first impression you want so uh there's a lot of work to be done with rural America, and uh, it's mostly been ignored. If you're a politician, you know, if you're a Republican, you can count on the rural vote. Check out my link about the voting in this area. If you're a Democrat, you know, you can't count on any kind of support in this area. So let's just ignore it, because who cares? We know that there, which way rural America is going to vote. So why bother taking care of it? And there we look again at the decayed Barber Auditorium. Now I don't want to sound totally hopeless. I'm going to show you a church here. A gentleman from Denver, Colorado was traveling with a friend to see as many states as they could. They passed through the southwest corner of North Dakota just to cross that one off their bucket list, which takes them through Marmoth, North Dakota. There's no other way. And he saw this church. And he said, this town needs me. And what did he do? He came, he moved to Marmoth, invested his money, and restarted the church. You know, not a huge congregation, but here's somebody pursuing a dream. And you know, I don't care, I'm not getting into the religion thing with this. I just want to point out, here's a guy following his dream, and his dream led him to Marmoth, North Dakota. Somebody trying to make it better. And I guess I'll take that over people who write off Middle America as a lost cause or the people who take it for granted without actually doing anything to make it better. But let's turn to happier topics. Marmoth has one more surprise left. 
for those of you who are willing to explore <laughs> Middle America, the flyover country, as some people call it. So if you head west of town, there is a really amazing museum. It's an antique car museum, and when I visited it, when I moved to the area, because I definitely don't live in Marmoth, uh, when I moved to the area, it was one building. It's now three buildings. It includes antique cars, horsey stuff, and more antique cars, and a whole bunch of display stuff, and an ice cream parlor. And this is in a town of 137 people. And you might be saying, okay, so they found a couple of old cars out in the field. Oh no, you just wait. Now I'm going to protect the privacy of the museum because I want you to actually explore it in person if possible. But I'm going to show you enough to give you a taste of what's there so you have a reason to explore it. So let's visit the museum. So the first building is full of cars and stuff. Uh, you can pay $10 to see one building, another $10 to see a second building, or you can pay $20 and see all three buildings. Which, okay. But anyway, first building, there's the second building and gate and the third building and I paid the twenty dollars just for you all so the second building is full of horsey stuff with wagons and horsey things and the third building is full of more cars because that's kind of what made the Van Horn Museum it's a thing uh, I'm kind of it's kind of wild that I actually vaguely know the man who the third building is named after Merle Clark um, in a town of 137 people. Now, at times, I probably came across as unfairly critical of Marmoth. That gravel streets don't bother me. But the trash, just in the middle of town and next to houses, yeah, that bothers me. Clean it up. You know, I, I don't mind, you know, I kind of, I'm definitely nobody's dream neighbor. But there is a point where you have, just have to say, hey, think of the people around you. And uh, that's one of the things I think Marmoth has trouble with, is people who just trash it up and don't think of the people around them. Uh, because there's some pretty awful spots in Marmoth. Uh, I think it's horrible to see what's happened to the main street of Marmoth that if you look at the old photos, was absolutely glorious. And I talked about this couple that met on the main street of Marmoth during a street dance. Uh, his dad talked him into going. Her sister talked her into going. And she met her cowboy there. And they had, I don't know, 60, 70 something years of marriage together. Um, here in Mar because of Marmoth. I, uh, I want this town to do better. There are some absolutely beautiful houses here. There's some absolutely garbage houses here. And, you know, I have nothing against a small house. I live in a small house. I have a problem with an abandoned house. It's just allowed to deteriorate and nobody cares. Nobody fixes it up. Marmoth has an abysmal location. And, you know, my town isn't much better, so I'm not going to criticize too much. But if you live in Marmoth, what do you do for a living? You work somewhere else. A lot of oil field workers, a lot of people that work in Baker, Montana. Some people that work in Bowman, North Dakota. A few that are lucky enough to find employment in Marmoth, but... There's not many jobs in Marmoth. And then for recreation, you've got, what, a bar? you got the smoke shop. You've got, actually, a really incredible museum, let's be fair. But 
Not a lot. You better be good at self-entertaining. You got a grocery shop? Oh, no, 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 no. You got to go out of town. Minimum of 18 miles. So Marmoth has a lot of working against it. But what a gorgeous location. If this had been on the interstate, I think this would have been the Medora of North Dakota. And let's be clear, I absolutely love the town of Marmoth. And that's why I wish they could do better. So, uh, if you're a special ed teacher, apply to my school first because we need you, a math teacher and a PE teacher. But if we don't take you, Marmoth needs a special ed teacher and they need an upper elementary teacher. So feel free to apply. If you don't know how to apply to Marmoth, let me know. I sort of know the superintendent and I definitely will put you in contact with her. So I uh, thank you for watching. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.